Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. And King, run, you huskies. Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Here's your last chance, fellas and girls. Absolutely your last chance to hear about the Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice terrific new offer. Send for your official challenge of the Yukon secret two-way signal light tonight. Imagine owning your own pocket-sized flashing signal light for sending secret codes and messages to your friends. This amazing signal light is like a special kind of flashlight. It works two ways. It actually flashes out beams of red light or beams of green light. Yes, it's the keenest new invention you've ever seen for signaling or for sending messages. You'll hear about it later on in today's program. Jim Reardon broke out of jail in Bristol City. It was four hours later when Sergeant Preston got the facts from Constable Morgan. I was just about to start out hunting for him, Sergeant Preston, when I saw you and your dog heading for my office. You've been a long time getting started. I know, but you see, I was on a hunting trip. The fool guard should have started looking for Reardon right away when he saw that he'd escaped. Instead, he came hunting for me. I see. Maybe King can get the scent and follow the trail. I remember Jim Reardon. He seemed like a fairly decent young fellow. He's a bank robber. That was proved? It was proved beyond the shadow of a doubt. He stole cash from the bank and stole a wallet and watch from Banker Durbin's desk. They did, eh? Yep. We found the wallet and some of the cash in Jim's cabin. I guess he must have buried the rest of the loot, including the gold watch. Well, lead the way to the cell, Constable. All right, Sergeant. I can find the scent and may be able to track him down. King got Jim Reardon's scent from a few belongings the fugitive had left behind. Then, at the head of Sergeant Preston's dog team, the great husky followed Reardon's trail. On King! On The trail of the fugitive ended abruptly at a narrow creek that cut across Sergeant Preston's path. On King! Here, King lost the scent of the man he had been following. Can't pick up his scent, eh, King? Never mind, fellow. It's all right. Come on, boy. Preston and his sled and dogs forded the swift-running creek and then continued north until they reached the isolated cabin of a dignified, white-haired physician named Siebert. The elderly doctor welcomed the sergeant and king. Doc, I'm looking for a man named Jim Reardon. He escaped from jail in Bristol City and he's traveling without supplies. He can't go far without food. Thought he might stop here to borrow some from you. No, sergeant, I haven't seen anything of him. I see. Well, he may try to get supplies from Sandy Danvers. Well, if he does, I feel sorry for him. Well, Sandy has a reputation for being miserly. I like Sandy, but I must admit that he's a skinflint. However, I suppose he's within his rights. In a country like this, Doc, no man has the right to turn away travelers in search of food and shelter. That's true, very true, Sergeant. Sandy's set in his ways. Well, we'll show up on. One king. I'm sorry you can't stay a while, Sergeant. We'll see you again. Bye, Doc. Goodbye, and I hope that you get your man. We'll do our best. All right, King. Up front. Sergeant Preston decided to go on and inquire at Sandy Danvers' cabin instead of going back to the creek to look for trail. On King! On! Sandy Danvers' cabin was some miles north of Dr. Siebert's place, and Jim Reardon was heading for that cabin. But two other men pushed through the snow to the same destination. Their names were Harry Jenkins and Jed Tardell. They knocked on the door of the most inhospitable man in the Yukon. Well, what do you want? Uh, Howdy, mister. We're trying to get to Jericho Flats north of here. 
But we found that the bridge is down up at the canyon, and we can't get across. Yeah, I saw you pass up here yesterday, heading north. Figured you'd be back. How can we get to the flats? You got to cut west and go around the end of the canyon. Well, that being the case, we're going to need some food. How about letting us have some grub? Listen, I gave the two of you information for free, but that's all I'll give you. We want supplies, and we're going to get them. A gun. A hold up. You going to give us some grub, or do you want us to help ourselves? I'll show you you can. No, you don't. Go. Harry, you brought that gun barrel down hard enough to crack his skull. Yeah, he had it coming. Now drag him inside the cabin. We'll close the door. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I'll see what I can find to eat. Harry, come here. Now, what's wrong? I don't like the looks of this old-timer. He's not moving at all. He'll come, too, pretty soon. He just knocked out, that's all. He's knocked out, all right. Permanent. Huh? You mean he's dead? See for yourself. Yeah, turn him over here. Yeah, I guess you're right. What do we do, Harry? Where's that door over there lead to? How do I know? I guess it's a woodshed. Yeah, we'll put the body in there. The two killers dragged the body into a small outer room that served as a woodshed. Yeah, now let's get some to eat. I'm hungry enough to eat raw hide. Uh, I'm glad we got him out of sight. I wouldn't feel right if I had to look at a corpse while I was here. <laughs> yeah, you're too squeamish, Jed. Come on, you can help me rustle up some grub. After seeing Jenkins kill Sandy Danvers with a single blow, Jed Tarbell was nervous. He spilled flour and salt as he used them to make sourdough biscuits. But the smell of cooking food soon dissipated his uneasiness. By the time the two were ready to eat, the neatly kept cabin was dirty and disorderly. They wolfed a substantial meal, then packed supplies and prepared to travel. You know the country west of here, Harry? Yeah. We pick up a trail right through the timber over there. Turns toward the canyon about a mile from Doc Siebert's place. Oh, two days of walking ahead of us. Let's see how much daylight we got left. I can tell by the sky how much daylight we got left. Come on. Yeah, this watch keeps time down to the second. Yeah, yeah, so you've said 50 times since you got it. Yeah, it's downright handsome. Put it in your pocket and keep it there. <laughs> yeah, the trouble with you is you're sorry you didn't get your hands on it before I did. If I had, I wouldn't be jughead enough to carry it. Durbin's initials on it, somebody's sure to recognize it. Did you clean out the old man's money chest? I didn't leave a thing in it. Come on, Harry. Someone from Bristol City might come by here and see us leaving this place if we don't get going. Nobody in Bristol City has a thing on us. We left there with a clean slate. <laughs> Thanks to that young fellow who was so handy for framing. Oh, well, same. I'll feel better when we're away from here. Yeah, I'm with you. What you it's snowing. Tracks will be covered. Now nobody will know we were here. <laughs> Come on, let's go. A short time after Jed Tarbell and Harry Jenkins left the isolated cabin, Jim Reardon halted his dogs in front of it and walked toward the door. Jim had been awake all night before the break, making his plans. He had traveled hard since escaping from jail and hoped to get a meal and be able to rest at the cabin. As he waited for the door to open, Jim looked over his shoulder nervously. Then he knocked again. Finally, he opened the cabin door. Hey! Anyone here? Better break than I hope for. I'll hold this door. Gosh, I'm so doggone tired. I can hardly see straight. I'll sit down on the bunk for a minute. When Jim Reardon sat on the bunk, his intention had been to lean back and rest a moment. But he forgot his weariness as he looked about the cabin. Hey, what? He noticed the dishes and food still on the table. He saw the shelves that had been ransacked. And the empty cash box with its broken lock. With his gun drawn, Jim moved to the door of the woodshed and opened it. He moved quickly to Sandy Danvers' side. Maybe he's not dead. Maybe he's just knocked out. I... Oh, he is dead. Of all the confounded luck. Well, old-timer, I can't do anything for you. 
anybody finds me here, I'm likely to get strung up for murder. I'll have to risk it. i got to get food and some rest. In spite of the snowfall that covered all tracks, the great dog King caught the scent of Jim Reardon and his dogs outside Sandy Danvers' cabin, even though the fugitives' dogs were out of sight. Okay. Sensing death, the mighty husky was uneasy. Sergeant Preston noticed his plaintive whimpering. What's wrong, King? Well, we'll go in and see, Sandy. Don't reach for your gun, Preston. Jim Reardon. Right. Easy, King. Hold it, boy. King's reaction to the young fugitive who held the gun on Sergeant Preston was instinctive. But Preston's command silenced his growls. Listen, Preston, stay out of here. Why? Why? Because... Because if you turn around and get out of here now, you won't get hurt. I'll hold my fire if you'll get on your sled and start traveling. What if I don't get on my sled? Then you're asking for whatever happens. Where's Danvers? Well, maybe he's, he's hunting or something. What are you looking for, Preston? I told you Danvers isn't here. I believe that. If he were here, you wouldn't be. Neither Sergeant Preston nor Jim Reardon had noticed King edging his way over to the door to the woodshed. The great husky snipped at the crack between the floor and the door. Then Sergeant Preston turned. What is it, boy? Preston, stay away from that door. I'm warning you, don't open it. Stand back, Jim. I've got you covered. Shoot me, and before you turn around, King will get you. You make a move to shoot him, I'll have time to put my own gun into play. Uh, Stop that gun, Jim. You win. That's better. Now I've got your gun, and I'm going to find out why you were so anxious to keep me from opening that door. You open it, Jim. Remember, I'm right behind you. I know when I'm licked. But Sergeant Preston, I didn't do it. I didn't kill him. You've got to believe me. Open the door, Jim. Done. He's dead. He was dead when I got here. He was laying right That's there. That's a mighty thin story, Jim. It's the truth. I didn't kill him. Only I know you'll never believe an escaped jailbird. Go on. Take me back to Bristol City and charge me with murder. There's nothing I can say or do to make you believe me. But I tell you, I'm innocent. You've got the wrong man. I didn't kill Sandy Danvers. We'll continue our story in just a moment. This is it. Today's the day. This is absolutely the last day. Yes, the very last day we can tell you how to send for your official Challenge of the Yukon secret two-way signal light for sending codes and messages. It's now or never. So act fast to get this amazing new signal light. It's like a special kind of flashlight. It's new, it's different, it's mystifying. It's two-way. That is, this flashing signal light sends out beams of red light or beams of green light. Think of it. It works two ways. It flashes either red or green. And it works with a simple flick of your finger. Imagine owning this amazing invention made specially for you for signaling and sending your own codes and messages to your friends. Why, it works much like blinker signal guns used by the Army and Navy. Yes, this mystifying signal light has a special plastic directional signal barrel. That's to prevent others from detecting your secret signal flashes except the person at whom they're aimed. And you can carry this amazing signal light anywhere you go without anyone detecting its presence. That's because it's pocket size. Less than four inches long, it fits snugly in your pocket without anyone being the wiser. Talk about fun and exciting. Say, you can make up secret codes and messages to signal friends. For instance, two red flashes might mean danger, stay back. Or one green flash and one red flash might mean help, come at once. Say, your new official challenge of the Yukon signal light is a beauty, too. Its color is glistening, shiny black. And it has Sergeant Preston's name in his own handwriting across the side. Important, too, this special signal light comes complete with standard replaceable electric bulb and battery, just like a real flashlight. Send for yours today. Send now for your secret signal light that flashes red, that flashes green. Just send 25 cents in coin. That's all. Just 25 cents and one box top from a package of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Include your name and address printed plainly on a piece of paper. And send it once to Flashlight, Chicago 50, 
Illinois. This mystifying, flashing signal light is not on sale in stores anywhere. Just remember, you must hurry. This is the last time, the last day we'll be able to make this offer on this program. So send 25 cents and a box top from Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. Mail to Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. I'll repeat, that's Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. And now to continue our story. After finding Cindy Danvers' body, Sergeant Preston spent several minutes looking around the cabin while Jim Reardon, an escaped prisoner from the jail in Bristol City, watched him nervously. Finally, Preston said, Jim, how long have you been here? Long enough to get a little sleep, get my dogs out of sight, and eat a meal. You were pretty careless preparing your meal, weren't you? Flour spilled on the floor. I didn't spill it. Someone walked through the flour, footprints in it. Come here, Jim. Put your foot here. All right. Hmm. You see, my footprint isn't as big as this one here, or as small as this one. Two men were here ahead of you. They must have had a meal and lit out of here. Cash box broken open. That, uh, that was open. Lock was smashed. What? Jim, Gosh. what's the matter? I don't know. I feel sort of sick all of a sudden. Now, look here, Jim, if this is a trick. No, no, no trick. Here, let me get you to the bunk. Oh, what's come over me? My stomach. There. Now, let's have a look at you. Jim Reardon's face drained of color. Sergeant Preston examined him and left King on guard while he went out to his sled for his medicine kit. When he returned, Jim tried to sit up. What's come over me, Sergeant? Can you fix me up? I think so. Lie back on the pillow. I'll give you some medicine. I can't understand. Sergeant Preston poured some medicine from a bottle and Jim swallowed it. Then the Maori said... Jim, you've been poisoned. What? Poisoned? How? The food you ate here must have been poisoned. That means I... I'm finished. No, you'll be all right in a few minutes. But the men who killed Sandy ate the same food you did. They'll be as sick as you are. And they'll feel mighty bad. They may go to Doc Siebert for help. Jim, do you feel well enough to travel? As long as I don't have to stand up, I can make it. You can ride on my sled. We've got to hurry. If possible, I want those cooks before they get to Doc's place. Sergeant Preston rearranged the supplies he carried in his sled to make room for Jim Reardon to recline as comfortably as possible. Then he covered Jim with furs. Meanwhile, Harry Jenkins and Jed Tarbell were about two miles from Doc Siebert's cabin when the effects of the poisoned food hit them. They forgot that their destination was Jericho Flats. Desperate for help, they made their way slowly to the doctor's cabin. There, the old man examined each of them. Oh, Doc, can you do anything for us? Oh, are we going to die? Are we, Doc? You two have been poisoned. Oh, poison. What's more, I know how you got poisoned. You must be wrong, Doc. We just ate some caribou steak, some biscuits, beans, and coffee. We didn't have nothing that was You poisoned. stole what you ate from Sandy Danvers. Doc, we don't know Danvers. We... Sandy has often told me that anybody who steals food from him would pay for it. They'd pay by being mighty sick and miserable. Why is that? Sandy hid the food for himself and his dogs. What's in plain sight in his place isn't fit to eat. You two are paying for eating it right now. Doc, we can talk things over later. Stop jawing now. Give us whatever you can to make us better. I'll fix you up. But as soon as you're able to travel, I'm taking the two of you back to Sandy's place. Then you can square yourselves with him. When they learned they were not fatally sick, the fears of the two killers vanished. And they were silent as they swallowed the medicines the doctor prepared. Several hours passed. Then Doc Siebert glanced at the gold watch on the table and said, Well, I calculate that you two are feeling well enough to travel now. Get your parkers on. What for? I told you I'm taking you back to Sandy's place, and that's where you're going. Here, we can't go back there. Don't worry, we're not. Oh, yes, you are. We're starting right now. Not so we... fast, Doc. A gun. Why, you addle-headed fools. What's the idea of threatening me? This is no threat, Doc. We mean business. Go on, Harry. Let him have it. You're crazy. You're out of your heads if you're willing to commit murder just to cover up a robbery. We got more than a robbery to cover. We can't let you live to squeal on us. More than a robbery? Yeah. You see, Doc, Danvers dead. Dead? That's right. Oh, my. You hadn't tipped your hand by telling us you knew we stopped at his place. Maybe we could let you live, but now... Harry, hold it a minute. What? 
Come on, he's coming. Thank heavens. Who is it, Dad? I don't know. It's a man with a sled and dog team. Come on, Doc. Take a look. You know who it is? Doc Siebert squinted as he looked through the window. First, he saw a seemingly lifeless form wrapped in furs on the sled. Then, Doc recognized Sergeant Preston running beside the sled and its grim cargo. Sergeant Preston. Preston. Melody. He'll deal with you, too. Harry, I've heard about Preston and his lead dog. Yes, so have I. Looks like a body on that sled. Hey, he must have found Danvers. Then he trailed us here from Danvers' cabin. How could he have followed us? The snow covered our tracks. Most likely the dog got our scent in the cabin. That dog's smart. I'm not aiming to tangle with a dog. What are you going to do? Hey, you leave it to me. I'll keep that cover while I deal with Preston. Sergeant Preston halted his sled and was about to approach the cabin when Harry Jenkins opened the door and called. Hold it, Preston. Who are you? Never mind who I am. All you have to do is follow orders. Stop that dog, Preston. What if I don't? My partner's inside. He's holding a gun on Doc Siebert. If you give me any argument, he'll let Doc have it. Hey, Jed, put a shot through the window just to let Preston know how things stand. Right. Hey, boy. Hold it. That's better. Now what? Now you tie that dog to the sled. I came to my sled? Yeah. And unless you want something to happen to Doc, you better make sure the knot's hold. He'll kill us any hole, Sergeant Preston. Don't you do it. What about it, Preston? You'll win. I'll tie King to the sled. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd be sensible. First, I'll take your gun. Sergeant Preston allowed Harry Jenkins to disarm him. Then, taking a length of strong rope from the sled, he tied King securely. <laughs> In spite of the big dog's protest, the Mountie tested the knots to be sure they would hold. I've heard that dog does whatever you tell him. What about it? Tell him he's to stay right there. He's not to try to get loose. Those knots will hold. I can see that. Only he might get ideas of chewing the rope apart. Talk so I can hear you. You're to stay here, fella. What's your next move? Your next move is into the cabin. And if you figure to try any tricks, forget it. Now, get going. Sergeant Preston, why don't you pull a gun and let him have it? They'll kill both of us. Then shoot King and make a clean getaway. Take it easy, Doc. Easy? How in tarnation can I take it easy? If I'd had any sense, I'd have let the two of them suffer after stealing food from Sandy Danvers. They came here and forced you to treat them for poison, eh? They didn't force me to treat them. It wasn't until they got to feeling better and I was ready to take them back to Sandy's place that they pulled a gun on me. Too bad you had to come along just when you did, Preston. Without a gun and your dog to help you, you're pretty helpless, aren't you, Manny? (laughs) I've heard a lot about you, Preston. I think you're overrated. I've never heard of you two. What are your names? Stand still, Preston. Don't get ideas of reaching for that chair and making a sudden throw. (laughs) That's what he was going to do, Harry. (laughs) I could see that. You're desperate, aren't you, Mounty? You're cornered like a rat. Stopped. <laughs> well, this is the end of the trail for you. And I'll bet a lot of men would give their souls to get you in this spot. Look at them gloat, they yellow-livered cowards. You should have heard them whine and crawl when they had stomach aches. They weren't so smart then. Lying on the sled, bundled in furs, Jim Reardon had heard the conversation between Harry Jenkins and Sergeant Preston. He had scarcely dared to move as the Mountie tied King and entered the cabin. Jim waited several seconds after the door closed. Then he cautiously pulled aside the furs that covered his face and raised himself to a sitting position. Looks like your master's in a bad way, King. Preston ought to have a knife in this bag. Quiet, boy, don't make a sound now. Here, this hunting knife will do. Now, King, let me get that rope. I'll have you free in a minute. Preston, you're first. After you, we'll shoot Doc. You won't get away with it. Kill me and another officer will take my place. You'll never get out of the Yukon alive. We'll set fire to the cabin and nobody will ever know Amani was in here. I wouldn't count on that if I were you. He's stolen, Harry. <laughs> yeah, I know he is. He won't stall any longer. Harry Jenkins was about to shoot when the door of the cabin suddenly flew open. A gray streak of fury leaped through the open door and struck the killer squarely. 
stunning force of King's attack sent Jenkins sprawling to the floor. At the same instant, Sergeant Preston went into action. I'll get your Preston. Are you done? That did it. You knocked him cold with one blow, Sergeant. Get away. Get back. You get him off me, Preston. Don't let this dog stand me. All right, King. Good work, boy. I've got his gun, now. Cut him off. Tell him to get back. On guard, King. Don't let him at me again. Follow my orders and King won't harm you. Get up. Where, where did he come from? How did he get in here? I let him in. I cut him loose and opened the door. Mister, you sure saved our lives when you did it. Where'd you come from? I was outside on Sergeant Preston's sled. Why, I thought that was Sandy's body on your sled, Sergeant. No, Doc. Sandy's body is still in his cabin. Good work, Jim. Doc, search these two. See if they have any other uh, weapons. It'll be a pleasure. You, you're first. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, you stand still. Get that dog. Oh. Trying to throw something out the window, eh? As long as you stand still, King won't make a move. I... How stand still? Yo, what's your name? Jenkins. Harry Jenkins. See what he was trying to throw out the window, dog? Sure thing, Sergeant. Why, it's just a watch. It's... Why, I've seen this watch before. It looks no like... No wonder he was trying to get rid of that. That watch belongs to Banker Durbin in Bristol City. Oh? Huh? That's the watch I was accused of stealing along with the cash from the bank. Harry, you big muttonhead. I told you to get rid of that watch. I told you to land us in jail if anybody recognized it. But no, you wouldn't listen to me. Shut up, Jack. I won't shut up. Was you that planned that frame up that was to keep Jim Reardon in jail for robbing the bank? Was you that hit the old man on the head and killed him? You and that watch, I knew it would get us into trouble. But nobody could tell you anything. Sergeant Preston, do you hear that? They did it. They're the ones that robbed the bank. I'm in the clear. Yes, Jim, I heard it. Now, you don't have to take me back to jail, do you? Not now. You're in the clear, Jim. Oh, gosh. Say, Sergeant Preston, is this young fellow here the one who escaped from jail, the one you were asking me about before? That's right, Doc. Well, I'd say this is a mighty good day's work. You found the men who killed Sandy Danvers, you got the man you were looking for, you straightened out a frame-up and caught up with the real bank robbers. You give me entirely too much credit, Doc. Nothing would have been solved if Jim hadn't opened the door for King. <laughs> Best fellow, until you came through that door, I thought this would be my last case. Thanks to you, it's not. <laughs> you saved my life, King. But this case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Fellas and girls, for the last time, here's how to get your amazing new official challenge of the Yukon signal light. That's the flashing signal light for sending secret codes and messages. To get yours, simply send your name and address, plus 25 cents and one box stop from delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Mail right away to flashlight... Chicago 50, Illinois. It's now or never. Here's that address again. Flashlight, Chicago 50, Illinois. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the White Husky. Jed Handy left a White Husky at my cabin while he took a short trip, and King soon looked upon her as his mate. But when King followed Whitey into a hail of bullets from a killer's gun, I felt sure they were both done for. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.